Okay, if we can reconvene, thanks for joining us. We have three great witnesses today. I had the pleasure of getting to talk to him early this morning. First, David Prend is general manager, a managing partner of Rockport Capital. Uh, David uh, joined Solomon Brothers in 1990. He promoted uh, to managing director and head of the Global Energy Investment Banking Group in 1998. He co-founded Rockport Partners, a merchant bank specializing in energy and environmental sectors. And um, 2001, he founded Rockport Capital Partners, which is a venture fund. And today, he's also testifying on behalf of the National Venture Capital Association, which we appreciate their great work. We also have David Abbasi, who leads Mission Point's regulatory and public policy research group. He's responsible for originating and structuring energy and environmental finance transactions. He was an appointee to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, served as senior advisor to the Office of Policy, and he co-chaired the Strategy for U.S. Environmental Technology Initiative and helped to produce our first U.S. Climate Action Plan. He's the author of a great book which starts with the quote, we are faced with the first, first urgency of now, and that's even as coming up in presidential debates, so people are listening to you. Hope you'll tell us the name of your book. Uh, Dan Brown joined, Brown enjoys us. Uh, he's the Director of Global Environmental Finance of Stark Investments, and we appreciate him clearing his calendar on short notice to join us. He's currently co-managing uh, an investment portfolio which is centered on the theme of global environmental finance and climate change. We're looking forward to at least five minutes of uh, good thoughts. Mr. Prend, if you could start. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, member of the committee. Uh, Rockport Capital Partners is uh, a venture capital firm based in Boston and Menlo Park. Uh, our funds comprise one of the largest pools of dedicated capital in the fast-growing sector of venture capital called clean tech. We manage about $400 million, and that amount is about to double. Um, as was said, I'm, I'm pleased to be here also on behalf of the National Venture Capital Association, which represents approximately 480 venture capital firms uh, in the United States and is committed to advancing those public policies that are con conducive to entrepreneurship and innovation and U.S. competitiveness. Uh, over our history, uh, Rockport Capital has invested in about 40 companies spanning a wide range of innovations, uh, including renewable energy such as solar and wind, uh, next generation transportation technologies such as hybrid and fully electric vehicles, smart grid technologies that enable more efficient use of the existing electric generation capacity, uh, clean air and water technologies, and energy conservation and green building technologies. Uh, I'd like to start by saying that I think the outlook for continued growth and investment in the renewable energy sector is excellent. And it's driven by a number of factors, most important being the promise of uh, exciting returns uh, based on the innovation in this space. Uh, we are today at clean tech, uh, where the IT industry was about 35 years ago and where the biotech uh, industry was about 20 years ago. And we are dealing in a much larger total market than either of those uh, two markets. Uh, the key issue today is what the federal government, in particular Congress, can do uh, to help cultivate uh, the environment for this uh, innovation. Uh, from what I know about the market demand and the technologies, and most importantly, the roadmaps of a number of these technologies, this is going to happen regardless of how intelligent the energy policy we have from the United States. So I, I think the challenge for the government is to come up with intelligent policies that foster a good transition uh, to minimize the pain that this economy is going to face uh, in this transition from old energy to new energy. Uh, these technologies make sense. Other countries are aggressively pursuing them with policies that uh, foster innovation, and there are a number of examples where other countries have taken the lead away from the United States already due to more enlightened policies. So that is what we're really dealing with here uh, in our humble uh, uh, view. It's not that whether this is going to happen, it's where the U.S. is going to stand uh, when this is all uh, done. Um, for the purposes of my oral testimony, I'd like to just focus on a few of the policies that uh, suggestions that I've provided uh, in the written uh, testimony. Uh, the first is 
the long-term uh, extension of the renewable energy investment tax credits and production uh, tax credits. Uh, we applaud the House for passing a very robust energy tax package. Ideally, from the investment community, we'd love to see these extensions over a long period of time, but I think we recognize the difficulty in longer-term credits from a budget point of view. However, I am here to urge you strongly to reach a compromise on the two bills and get a bill signed uh, into law without delay. I can cite several examples from my own portfolio companies where young, fragile companies that are doing uh, good things for the economy and creating jobs in this economy are having to already, uh, and fortunately small companies are good at being nimble, having to turn on a dime and move from sales in the United States to sales in places like Spain and Korea because of the, the uncertainty about the ITC. Another uh, important uh, area is the National Renewable Energy Standard, which I would recommend uh, in the range of 20 percent, combined with decoupling of utility revenues to disconnect the utility's incentive to get profits from increasing uh, kilowatt hour sales. What we'd really like to see is energy efficiency and not penalize uh, the uh, companies for this uh, uh, saving uh, energy. Uh, third, transportation, I think, is very important. Um, uh, rather than favoring just biofuels, I think encouraging a results-oriented approach. Uh, we, in particular, have four investments uh, in the areas of electric drivetrain and hybrid vehicles. Even with the very meager subsidies that there are right now for those technologies, those technologies make a lot of sense from a marketplace, even without some intelligent incentives. Uh, if nothing else, just the CAFE standards helps to level the playing field uh, among technologies rather than favoring one type of transportation technology over another. Uh, fourth, I'd like to highlight R&D spending. Uh, I serve on the advisory board of NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab, and in fact two of our most promising companies uh, use technologies that were not developed at NREL, but the expertise that was resident at NREL was substantially helpful in actually getting these technologies to the place where they're market. One of them is in the market today and doing very, very well. The other one's about to launch an exciting new product uh, in the solar uh, space that I think is going to revolutionize the solar in industry. Uh, the chairman earlier noted uh, the tremendous impact that venture has on job growth and the economy. Um, and uh, I think the energy industry today is a new market opportunity where uh, innovation uh, has the opportunity to, uh, to create even more jobs and more exciting uh, opportunities uh, for people than, than these previous uh, examples of success in the, uh, in the venture capital community. Uh, every single clean tech company that we invest in today holds a promise of bringing a much needed innovation. When that happens, there are many winners. Our investors are definitely winners, entrepreneurs, and most importantly, the American public who will benefit from new jobs, new companies, and a cleaner environment. For a venture capitalist, it is definitely the inter intersection of the best of all worlds. We can do well by doing good. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Brand. And just so you know, everything you said, the chair totally agrees with you, so that's bonus. You'll get, that's why you had additional time. So, <laughs> Mr. Braun. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Um, it is uh, truly a great honor uh, to be here today to discuss uh, federal policy measures that will enhance investment in clean energy technology. Uh, before I begin my testimony, I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge our Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, as he mentioned earlier uh, in this conversation. Uh, he is my hometown congressman. I want to thank him for his service to the Wisconsin 5th. And he's done some, he, he did some great job for the country in India. You should compliment him. We went there, met the Dalai Lama, and he made some very eloquent comments about Tibetan religious freedom. So. Oh, excellent. Um, thank you. A little bit about Stark Investments. Uh, we've got more than 20 years of experience, and over that time we've grown to become one of the largest uh, alternative investment firms in the industry, currently managing uh, approximately $14 billion. In my role as portfolio manager, my job is to allocate financial capital in alternative energy technology, among other investments. My focus is to explore the financial implications of living in a carbon-constrained world. Over the last several years, the Stark team has allocated capital to alternative energy investments in both public and private markets. 
I would like to focus my testimony today on four major issues, and I'll get through this quickly so we can get to questions. First is the connection between federal energy legislation and capital market engagement. Second, I'll be addressing the need for an unencumbered price signal uh, for carbon. Third, I'll deal uh, with market uncertainty. And finally, um, I'll touch upon some of the lessons learned from the European Union emission trading scheme. First, the recently signed energy bill and future legislative efforts by this body to regulate greenhouse gas emissions will directly affect capital market al allocation. With regard to potential CO2 emission reductions program, all eyes are on Washington. The Congress has been working pragmatically to pass climate change legislation. It is also significant that today, President Bush just finished uh, presenting his ideas on dealing with these types of issues. Institutional investors like myself are watching this activity closely because we will only be able to engage if there is a clear legislative mandate, a point that we discussed earlier today. Second, if Congress is interested in the full engagement of the capital markets, the most powerful action this body can take is to set a hard physical limit or cap on CO2 emissions and mandate a long-dated tax credit and loan guarantee portfolio for clean energy solutions in addition to cap and trade. It needs to be a combination of short-term and long-term solutions. The most important aspect of a capital market solution is the idea of an unencumbered price signal. Cap and trade markets with artificial price conditions, safety valves, off-ramp conditions will ultimately distort the price signal for greenhouse gas emissions and make it difficult for investors to gauge completely. Using the basics of supply and demand, we know that a market clearing price will lead to the best use of financial or technological resources. Any artificial price condition disrupts that very simple balance. Third, I'd like to address the issue of market uncertainty. I've listened to policymakers and stakeholders talk about market-based solutions and have encountered both fact and fiction. One common theme is that volatility is a bad thing. In fact, some degree of volatility is characteristic of a properly functioning market. The price of a financial asset or liability is very important information to institutional investors. I've also heard from skeptics that there is free money to be made by financial players investing in alternative energy under a cap and trade system. I can only wish that was the case. <laughs> On the contrary, uh, private sector investors will apply financial resources to investments that will yield a return that is a function of risk. In simple terms, new technologies are extremely risky investments. We run a great risk of being wrong. Finally, I'd like to discuss lessons learned from the first phase of the EU ETS. The overallocation of credits in the learn while doing first phase of the program caused financially traded credits to expire with negligible value. To those that use that argument to say that cap and trade does not work, I would suggest to the contrary. The market considers all available information to arrive at a price. It is worth noting that the second phase of the EU ETS has seen relatively stable uh, prices because there was not this issue of overallocation of credits. In conclusion, a necessary element involved here is the trust that capital markets will work. The commoditization of carbon dioxide emissions is not without precedent. We now trade greenhouse gas emissions that resulted from the 1990 amendments to the Clean Air Act. If done correctly, investors will fully engage in creating the solution set. The mandate of the capital market is to assume the risk of developing and commercializing next-gen alternative energy technologies so taxpayers don't have to. As we move beyond politics and money, we will see that this is a partnership between capital markets and Washington that is capable of achieving sustainability, energy security, and a low-carbon global economy. I respectfully submit my testimony to the public record. Look forward to answering questions or providing further comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Braun. Mr. Robopsi. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Dan Abassi. And I'm a senior director with Mission Point Capital Partners, which is an investment firm uh, in Nor Norwalk, uh, Connecticut, that is exclusively focused on financing the transition to a low-carbon economy. Uh, the committee requested our perspective as clean energy investors on the outlook for the renewable energy industry and on what policies, including uh, what carbon regime, would uh, best promote uh, deployment uh, and innovation. So I appreciate the opportunity to summarize my testimony uh, to the select committee at this important moment in national policy making on these issues. Uh, and would ask that my written testimony be submitted for the record. So ordered. 
Mission Point Capital was uh, founded and is chaired by Mark Schwartz, uh, former chairman of Goldman Sachs Asia and CEO of Soros Fund Management. Uh, our team has deep energy and environmental domain expertise uh, from uh, based on senior roles in finance, technology, uh, policy, and operations at such firms as uh, General Electric, uh, ABB, uh, Swiss Re, uh, United, United States Environmental Protection Agency, uh, Keyspan, uh, and FMC. Our carbon-centered uh, investment thesis is really grounded in two uh, convictions. Uh, first, that unabated climate change is the greatest foreseeable risk uh, facing humanity today. And second, that uh, mitigating it constitutes one of the greatest uh, investment and job creation opportunities in history. Uh, evidence indicates that climate change is accelerating, uh, even to the point of routinely uh, astonishing field scientists. Uh, and uh, Mission Point aims to respond by accelerating, in turn, the formation and deployment of capital to reduce emissions in the window that remains uh, open to us to avoid uh, the most severe impacts of climate change. At Mission Point, we're investing hundreds of millions of dollars in private companies uh, that can generate clean energy and cut carbon emissions, and taking an active role in building those companies. Examples include uh, solar development and technology companies, including one called Sun Edison, uh, a wind operations and maintenance services company uh, called Upwind a uh, specialty finance company called Hannon Armstrong, which is overcoming financial, uh, finan financing obstacles to energy enhancements, including in the federal government, a uh, carbon offset development and finance com company called uh, Greenhouse Gas Services, which we uh, have launched with General Electric and AES, a uh, carbon trading infrastructure company, a company called Advanced Aerofoil Technologies, which manufactures advanced turbine uh, components to increase efficiency at natural gas plants, and also offers software that optimizes uh, operation of, of gas and coal plants, reducing uh, uh, fuel use uh, as well as emissions. So we believe that mitigating carbon is primarily a uh, commercialization and adoption problem, not an innovation problem, uh, meaning that the technologies in many cases are already in existence and simply need to be uh, pulled through into widespread usage. This belief leads us to focus less on new venture investing, though we do uh, uh, do in venture investing when we find exceptionally transformative opportunities and innovations, uh, but really more on uh, growth stage uh, companies. So fundamentally, we believe that the energy sector is in the midst of a uh, profound transformation. The two primary criteria we used to demand of our energy were that it be cheap and reliable, and uh, now uh, today we've added really two more, which is secure and clean. So optimizing that uh, four-dimensional equation uh, really uh, does change things. It requires us to bring new levels of entrepreneurship to the energy sector than it has really ever seen before. Renewable energy is thriving with 20 to 40 percent year-over-year compound growth rates because it answers well to the two new criteria, secure and clean, and is getting much more uh, competitive on the first two, uh, cheap and reliable. Uh, it's becoming more affordable as it scales, uh, the declining cost curves are a robust trend. We're seeing the potential for uh, grid parity uh, for solar, unsubsidized solar, as soon as uh, 2015. Uh, renewables are also achieving higher reliability, uh, which with uh, added experience and operating hours. So key point number one uh, from us is really that uh, our outlook for growth, investment, and job creation in the strategic industry is bullish, based on direct hands-on experience with our portfolio companies. Uh, as well as on high industry growth rates and on the strategic value of the industry on the dimensions I've mentioned. I would expect that uh, the job creation potential here would be particularly welcome given the economic conditions in our country today, and would just add there that the renewable industry is particularly job intensive. Uh, for example, one megawatt of solar uh, produces, uh, according to some studies, on the order of seven to ten times the number of person hours of employment as one megawatt of conventional power. Key point number two, and here I'm underscoring what uh, the prior panelists have said, is that our ability to continue to invest in realizing this bullish forecast and accelerating the growth of this industry really does depend on a comprehensive and stable uh, set of supportive policies, including a long-term extension of the investment in production tax credits uh, that remain in limbo today, and uh, at long last, putting a price on carbon as a rule of the road, which we believe will be just enormously catalytic. So first, on the investment tax credit and the production tax credit, uh, the boom-bust cycle of expiration of these credits has historically driven a clear drop-off in renewable power installations. Uh, those of us in the industry spend time estimating, underwriting, and trying to share the extension risk around these credits, pondering the imponderables of what, uh, whether and when Congress may act. And the compromised one-year extension cycles really don't give enough time 
uh, to get a wind project placed into surface, let alone something uh, like a, a geothermal project. So we can't under underwrite business plans in these situations. Once it's operating, the 10-year horizon of, of the production credit is not always sufficient to provide the needed return on these capital-intensive projects. So really, Congress does need to send a stronger, uh, more stable, and long-term signal to the investment community. Uh, the durations really should be matched to the pro long project life cycles as well as the uh, long project uh, cash flow durations. So it's pretty straightforward. Uncertainty uh, in the financial world translates to higher costs of capital, which translates to project is delayed or canceled. Uh, and I, uh, by one estimation, uh, the current expiration risk is, is putting at risk 42,000 megawatts of, uh, of uh, new construction. One of our portfolio companies, Sun Edison, is an example of a company whose innovative deployment model for solar power has counted on the ITC in these early years, but that is rapidly scaling the industry down its cost curve uh, by deploying solar systems on Walmarts, Kohl's, other big box retailers, and uh, you know, other uh, um, commercial entities. So we, uh, we hope you can navigate the PAYGO uh, face-off between the oil and gas and renewable industries and get this done soon. Um, the the face-off is somewhat ironic to us because it really underscores that both industries are in fact subsidized. Uh, and also uh, the way that we think about the climate change narrative is that it's really not between these industries. In fact, uh, we believe we are going to have to continue to invest in the fossil fuel sector, but do so in a way that aggressively manages the carbon liability uh, in the decades ahead that they'll be with us. The low carbon playing field, both for policy and investing, is much bigger than renewables. Uh, the way to stimulate this uh, is to make sure that the stable policy framework is built on the foundation of carbon pricing, and we believe this should be through a cap, uh, cap and trade system. Putting a price on carbon will reward investments in companies like advanced aerofoil technologies, which reduce emissions of fossil fuel power plants. Um, and, and you know, we would acknowledge that the, these kinds of investments are not as iconic or, or photogenic. Uh, as the large and centralized uh, 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 carbon flows that, that we see in these, these uh, large fossil fuel assets and reducing them, but uh, it is uh, very important that we address them. Mr. Bossi, I want to yep. make sure we get to some questions. Yes. So maybe you could wrap up. Yes, I'll wrap up. So in conclusion, uh, we, we also believe that the carbon capture and, and storage uh, industry is, is strategic in this, uh, but it is, uh, relatively speaking, a pure play investment and does require a, pr a price on carbon. Uh, and uh, we would, we would uh, encourage you to do that. Uh, the U.S. is right now the runaway leader in, in moving and compressing and injecting carbon dioxide. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a critical technology, and we'd, we'd like to see uh, the price on carbon uh, facilitate that. Concluding, uh, just our desi quick design points is uh, we would prefer a cap and trade over a carbon tax. We would prefer a uh, stringent emissions target uh, with a prompt start by 2010, a periodic reassessment provision that is based on objective indicators, and an upstream point of regulation. Uh, we also have some uh, contributions, uh, some ideas about uh, the carbon border levy, and I'll look forward to discussing those in the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Bossi has some other great ideas in his book, Americans and Climate Change, that he's authored, which is on the chair's nightstand. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start with Mr. Blumenauer. Um, I had a chance to question you this morning. Mr. Blumenauer, you'd like to start? You hold Thank it. you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I uh, appreciate uh, that our witnesses have more information here than they have a, a chance to do, and I appreciate your courtesy because I, I'm in a markup in ways and means across the way. Um, I guess I am concerned about uh, putting three things on the table, and because there won't be time really to elaborate on them now, it's something I'd like to follow through with you folks on. Um, uh, one, you, I haven't heard you mention the opportunities to adjust how we regulate um, electricity and other utility rates. Um, as you know, some utilities around the world are looking at um, having part of the rate of return contingent on carbon performance and other indicators. Um, I've got a hometown utility that uh, pioneered uh, decoupling so that the gas utility wasn't penalized. Uh, for uh, conservation, but I am interested if you could help us with thoughts, ideas about how we might use innovative regulatory schemes to incent utilities uh, to allocate costs in the right way and that there might be, it might provide an incentive for the adoption of, of uh, new forward uh, thinking um, and advanced uh, energy technologies. 
that we that we bury that we embed that in the rate regulatory system so it happens automatically and they're rewarded and a more appropriately allocated costs and it's a, it's a conversation I would pursue with any of you individually the second um, concern I have and uh, Mr. Abbas you, you referenced it on the Ways and Means Committee we've tried to shift um, subsidies from a mature oil uh, industry that has proven that they can make lots of money um, uh, selling the world's most profitable commodity, expensive commodity, to shift it in other areas. The extent to which um, we could have your help fine-tuning ways that other subsidies might be reallocated so that uh, the tax code is more even-handed. The third area that uh, we would be uh, keenly interested in thoughts and observations is how the federal government could lead by example. I appreciate what you say in terms of being thoughtful about the regulatory scheme, about, uh, you know, I, we're trying to embed the production tax credit in the next stimulus package because it's going to, we're going to lose jobs if we don't do that. But the federal government, as the largest landlord, landowner, employer, and consumer of energy, uh, has an opportunity to pack, practice uh, the best practices uh, by our own, uh, the products that we buy, the standards that we set, uh, and would be keenly interested in your thoughts and observations about how we might be able to use the vast power of the federal government itself, the Department of Defense, General Services Administration, to achieve that. Um, I've got a couple more minutes here that I'd turn over to you folks for any thoughts or observations on it, but my staff and I would love to follow up with you in greater detail on those three points as you see fit. Somebody wants to jump in. That sure. Well, I'll take the first one, uh, regulating electricity. I think uh, that that is a very good point. I, I applaud the utility in your, in your home district. Um, decoupling is definitely something that I think gets at one of the big problems in, uh, in energy industry right now, which is that there's this huge amount of invested infrastructure that any new technology and new uh, uh, business has to get over before it can, um, it can, uh, can thrive. And I, I would point out that a lot of those, a lot of that inf infrastructure was originally uh, funded by a lot of government incentives. Uh, I think there are a number of ways to go about that. I think the trick, as you uh, pointed out, is coming up with another way to make it profitable for the utilities to save energy, not just uh, manufacture more energy. And uh, the, uh, one of the things that one of our portfolio companies has done, a company called Converge that went public last year, was to look at the existing regulatory framework and say, how can we outsource uh, what they call megawatts, which is uh, saving uh, power in times when there is a peak demand, uh, and the regulatory bodies were able to incorporate that kind of a thing into uh, the framework. Investment is another question, and I think there does need to be some sort of regulatory framework that allows investments to be recouped uh, on some sort of reasonable rate of return uh, for energy saving projects. Uh, uh, that might be uh, invested in by the utilities. Uh, I think from our perspective, the challenge is, is the, uh, the public utility commissions of each state are very protective of their turf, and it seems to us that it's been hard for the federal government to get into that, uh, that arena. To the extent that the federal government can get into that arena, I think it would be a, a real positive, because one of the, this patchwork that we have of uh, different states with different uh, investment incentives does make it harder for a small company that doesn't have the resources of an Exxon or a Duke Power to be able to figure out that whole landscape. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your Congressman. Uh, Mr. Bussey, why don't you? Mr. Bussey had a comment. 
Uh, two two quick examples, uh, and then I'll uh, defer to, uh, to Dan. Uh, one is uh, the energy saving performance contracts. Uh, this is an existing contractual vehicle that uh, has been in existence since 1978, I believe. One of our portfolio companies, Hannon Armstrong, has been a, a leader in securitizing the cash flows from those. Uh, we have not understood why, but this year uh, the Defense Department has really not been using that authority to the extent that they have in the past. It lo it's looking like somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 percent of the prior usage. And this comes at a time when the actual energy efficiency standards have been strengthened through EPAC 2005 and the January 2007 executive order issued by the President uh, looking for um, uh, 3 percent year-over-year uh, reductions in energy uh, intensity, uh, reaching 30 percent by 2015. So there's an existing vehicle, and what these contracts do is they allow the, um, uh, the government to not appropriate the upfront funding for the energy efficiency investment and then to reap that, the benefit of those. So it's an energy savings share uh, with, uh, uh, you know, that, that is facilitated through this third party finance. To date, it's been quite successful over the years 400 projects, uh, 5.2 billion in uh, savings. Uh, somewhat smaller on the net basis, but a very substantial savings. So we're somewhat perplexed by why that isn't being used to its full extent, and I guess we'd encourage you to the extent there are formal or, or informal things you could do uh, to prompt them to, uh, to use that, and we'd be happy to work with you to, to facilitate that. A second very quick one is I understand the Defense Department has requested uh, that uh, uh, contracting authority uh, for power purchase agreements be extended uh, from the current limit, which is 10 years, up to 20 years, which is much more in line with what a typical re renewable power uh, developer needs to have in order to finance their, their projects. So this is what municipalities are doing. This is what private sector uh, buyers are doing, utilities and so forth. It would be great to have the federal government, as you said, the largest user of energy, uh, to, to also have that authority. And Congressman, I'd like to, uh, to take the, the opportunity to respond completely to all three of those points. Well, I realize that you're on your way to a markup meeting, uh, committee meeting, so I'll, I'll take the next week or two and get back to you with those responses. I would like to touch on the third point that you mentioned, uh, this whole idea of how can the federal government lead by example. The, um, the House of Representatives is a member of the Chicago Climate Exchange and uh, bought right. carbon right. credits no, essentially to, right. to lower the carbon. Right. I think that's frankly admirable uh, in terms of leadership on this issue. This morning we were talking about what the glide path might look like for cap and trade legislation. Well, this is a very long dated proposition. The whole idea is what can we do uh, in the interim period, in essence, to, to get some momentum behind this. And I think that was an extraordinary uh, measure taken by uh, Speaker Pelosi in the House of Representatives. And, and got a lot of flack. Capital. Got a lot of flack for it, um, but yes, I, Th that's true, I agree. But that that'll no, no, happen no. when something no, no. new is done. No, no, uh, I, <laughs> I think it's terrific. But I, I think that's if great. you can keep doing that type of thing, you're basically sending a very powerful message to uh, every part of the economy that look, this is this is coming, and we've got to start to deal with it. Well, I I, I appreciate uh, your uh, your courtesy and uh, look forward to following up with each of you in detail on that, because these are, these are things that are extraordinarily uh, of interest to me, and um, I am convinced that in each of these areas we can do things that don't cost, and that literally are not, don't have a budget impact, um, but that can send the signals that you're talking about, and I really appreciate your examples. It's very, very helpful to us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Bossi, with your permission, we will uh, look into this with the Pentagon to see if we're missing the boat here recently on that. So if we can work with you on this regard. Terrific. We're going to have a vote shortly, so I'm going to have just a couple quick questions. First, um, in, as, in as brief form as you can, why are tax incentives not enough? Why do we need a cap and trade or renewal electrical s standard or decoupling? Why, why isn't just handing out some tax credits enough? I'll handle that one first, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in my opinion, uh, an unencumbered price signal in a cap and trade is a very p a pure price signal. A properly functioning capital market for any commodity will deliver the lowest cost, poss the lowest possible cost of abatement. Um, the difficulty with a, a tax credit or a tax, a carbon tax, is that it's an artificial price condition. Uh, I've mentioned in, in testimony that was submitted that when an artificial price condition is introduced into a market, you, you begin to move away from uh, what can be thought of as optimal allocation of resources towards a solution. 
you know, I don't know if the price of carbon in the United States is a dollar, ten dollars, a hundred dollars. Uh, but the only way to find out really where the market clearing price is is to use a cap and trade uh, system. Mr. Bussey? No. The uh, point earlier about uh, the, the need for us to reach beyond just the renewable sector, really, uh, there are tremendous opportunities on supply side efficiency. As I said, in the fossil fuel sector, that's where most of the, uh, the carbon is flowing today and where the reduction opportunities are, are also very significant, as well as on the demand side, just tremendous uh, opportunities. So what we really need is a broad pricing signal to motivate and discipline really all market participants. And by that, I mean, uh, you know, investors, entrepreneurs, large corporations, even consumers uh, to respond. If you unleash the market, we know that it's not predictable, but we do know that we'll unleash tremendous uh, uh, entrepreneurship and finding every last uh, emission reduction opportunity at the lowest cost possible. That's what the market's good at. So what it needs is just that rule of the road. We really think of that as the foundation. And then these more targeted uh, investment tax credits and so forth for specific sectors like the renewable sector are very, very important given the, the stage in those technologies development. But uh, this overarching uh, uh, platform of a carbon signal will pervade the economy and, and produce uh, you know, tremendous uh, uh, opportunities. And uh, I was talking to some folks in the uh, electrical industry the other day, and they were expressing fear of, of speculation and speculators in a carbon market. And that might be perhaps exacerbated by the run-up in gas prices we've experienced and some of our concerns that actually there has been some volatility in those markets because of some questionable uh, trading going on, or at least non-transparency in the markets. What should we do to allay or answer those fears? And are there things to do in this market to prevent, to make sure there's transparency and, and no gamesmanship that we experienced in Enron uh, in this regard? Uh, I'll, I'll start with that one, uh, Mr. Congressman. Um, I, I would- gonna, We've got about 60 seconds. I've got to run uh, and vote. Okay. So. So, so ITC, I think, is the most important thing from a small company investment point of view. Uh, the, uh, I would not even put cap and trade as the second. I think cap and trade is an important part of an overall approach. But from a small company's point of view, as opposed to maybe a slightly different view from these gentlemen, I think uh, it is uh, something that is part of an overall policy but is not the most important thing. I think the, the ITC is by far the most important because that's something we have to, today. And to take it away is like imposing a huge new tax increase on these small uh, nascent industries. Well, as we discussed, we're going to try to get that done as, as quickly as possible. We have a lot of other questions. Look forward to working with you. Thanks for your testimony. It's very valuable. We're going to share it with others. This is the, the can-do folks. You're the can-do people, and we appreciate you, uh, you joining us. Thanks very much. With that, we're adjourned. Thank you.